Hello, welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana here with Jamie. How are you, Jamie? I'm doing great. How about you? Hey, I'm good. I'm glad we get to jump on and record and continue on in our Proverbs 31. What's been new since we last jumped on together? Well, I heard a rumor that Alaska has gotten dumped on with snow. Is that we true? did get a big snow? Yeah, we woke up Tuesday. There was a snow day, which rarely happens out here. And yeah, I haven't left the house. We're recording on a Thursday. I haven't left the house since sometime Monday afternoon. My Jeep's just kind of <laughs> buried, basically, like you can barely see it. So it's not a troubling amount or anything. I just need to wait until the snowplow can come and do our road <laughs> in our driveway. So yeah, it's it's kind of surreal being on the other end of it and seeing, you know, I remember in the winters seeing pictures of other people and it was still fall looking outside and then, on <laughs> you know, on Facebook or whatever. And now being on the other side of it, you know, I look out and it's like fall, but then I heard that Anchorage got, you know, 12 yeah. inches of snow. <laughs> yep. So Lots I don't know. Snow. And you guys get more sometimes than we do. Sometimes. Yeah. Although the last couple of years, I think Anchorage has set a few records, but happy yeah. winter slash fall. Or if you're in the Southern hemisphere, it's probably summer between summer and spring for you. So that's right. Happy, happy whatever you're in, or if you happy live whatever kind of, weather you're in, if you grew up around where I did in California, happy months, because they all look about the same. <laughs> So it's either summer or not summer. Like that's basically what I remember of seasons from growing up. <laughs> In California? Yeah. Yeah. So. I am excited to jump back into Proverbs 31. I know we read this one last time and we did it just for fun, but we didn't get to really discuss it. So we're going to start back in verse 27 of Proverbs 31. And if you're new, we've just been going through a series through the Proverbs 31 verses about the virtuous wife and asking ourselves, how does the Proverbs 31 woman pray? What can we learn from it? So I'm excited to jump in and we already talked about bread, so I don't have a good just for fun yet, but maybe I'll come up with one by the time we read the verse. <laughs> so 27 says she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. So let's make our just for fun today to be about the first half of that. She watches over the affairs of her household. Did you ever catch your mom? I don't want to use the word spying, but did you ever feel like your, your privacy as a daughter was violated? What happened? Oh, all the time, all the time. My mom was definitely of the opinion that, you know, you're in this house and what you do isn't secret until you're mm -hmm. out of the house kind of thing. Like, uh -huh. you know, I, I remember one time in particular that she was going to have, I had a jacket, my best friend and I had matching leather jackets. They were like, like suede puffy coats. I think they sold them at Costco mm -hmm. or Sam's mm -hmm. club or something. And so for Christmas, we both asked, this was in high school. We both asked for the same jacket. And I love that jacket. I wore it faithfully every day, but it got kind of dirty because it was suede and you couldn't really even spot cleaning. It was kind of tough mm -hmm. because of the, the suedeness of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, my mom was going to have it dry cleaned. And so she emptied the pockets, not to spy, right? Uh -oh. because she needed to. And so I remember that we had gone to the dollar store, my best friend and I, we had gone to the dollar store and she had gotten these, like, I don't know, they were like supposed to be vitamin supplements that were supposed to be really good. I don't remember what they were supposed to do, if they're supposed to give you energy or mm -hmm. what the deal was, but they were these oh, no. little, <laughs> oh, no. they were, they were scary looking. They had clear capsules and it looked like. I don't even know what it was. It was like like yeah. powdery, herby stuff in it. But your mom found some pills. Now, were they in the bottle or were they in just like a Ziploc or something? They So they had come in this chintzy little like packet with like a clear plastic oh, yeah. packet with a stapled on like informational thing that I had taken off. And they, and I, they were just in my pocket. So they looked like drugs. I mean, yeah. they, they looked like a I'm weird sure. drug. And my mom freaked out. So I remember being at the dinner table and she also found like, she found notes that were, you know, do you, did you ever like fold up the notes into like the weird, Those like little triangles, triangles. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know okay. exactly what you're talking about. 
So another aspect to this was she found some notes and my friend and I, and my friend, I will give her all the credit, Amy. She was the mastermind of everything cool that we uh -huh. did. And maybe a few things that were maybe a little naughty. I don't know, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but she was like, she was the mastermind. So she, we kind of like came up with this language and it was an alphabet that oh. was like, it was, it was a code kind of. Right. And we mm -hmm. memorized it and we were able to at this and it was like the letters of the alphabet only like kind of like switched back and forth like uh -huh. an, an A actually looked more like a B just to kind of mm. make it easier to remember. But right. it was like anyway, it looked like hieroglyphics or something uh -huh. um, the way that we did it, but we sort of memorized it so we could pass notes and say stuff without anybody else yeah. understanding it. So anyway. My mom found those too. And she was like, what is this sorcery? No, she is mom, just like, that's what just are, my magic spell. What are you hiding? She didn't think Aww. it was spells or anything, but she thought I was like trying to hide stuff. Yeah. And anyway, so I just remember that conversation at the dinner table of, I emptied your pockets out and I found, and anyway, she thought that they were drugs. That was the biggest thing. And oh, yeah, I bet terrified. And I tried yeah. to explain to her and she ended up believing me about it, yeah. you know, what it really mm -hmm. was, but it, it terrified her. So that's the like Snoop story. But in uh -huh. general, I'm sure she read my journals, my, you know, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. She just, she kind of was under, you know, in, in this mindset of, you're, you're living under my roof. There are really no secrets from me and you yeah. need to live on the up and up. Uh -huh. So I don't know. How about you? Well, I have a story about phone stuff. So basically our rule with cell phones is the kids need to be willing to hand their phone over to us and let us look at anything they want if we ask, but we've only like used that right maybe like I remember two times but one of the times there's it starts as this really sad story so my son I needed to drive him into Anchorage for some reason and the Hamptons house was unavailable and it was so heartbreaking so anyway we're we're spending the night at a different friend's house and they had a guest room and he and I were sharing the room and so I'm visiting downstairs with our friends. I come upstairs and he's lying in bed on his phone and it looks like he is FaceTiming an adult male. And so I, you know, that I've never seen. So I freak out, I'm like, what are you doing? Give me your phone. And it turns out he was just like watching a reel. <laughs> but <clears throat> the way that it looked like it truly looks like he was like in this face-to-face -face conversation with a strange adult man <laughs> that's happened to me before with our kids where <laughs> yeah. I where I've caught a glimpse and I'm like what are you doing are you and and I or I've heard a voice or something uh -huh. <laughs> and it sounds like they're having a convert you know yeah. like it's someone conversing but yeah well, how about, I mean, I, we have exactly the same rule. It's basically, mm -hmm. I'm not going to snoop on your phone. I'm going to ask mm -hmm. for it. And at any point in time, you need to know that like the conversations you're having yep. are, are going to be seen at some point. And mm -hmm. I don't enforce it. And there are times though, when I think mm, maybe I need to do it more mm -hmm. just to kind of remind them that mm -hmm. the things that they're doing. That but it's there. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, technology is tough though, because thinking back, there were notes, there were face-to-face -face conversations. I do think that one time my mom was listening in on a conversation with me and my boyfriend, like, you uh -huh. know, how you uh, like a phone call to me, phone or a... right. Exactly. The phone where like, I'm on the one line and, yeah. and she's able to pick up the phone very quietly from mm -hmm. a different physical phone, but exactly. listen in on the same conversation, which by the way, my kid, one of my kids, our youngest, was saw that on TV and said, is that really, was that possible? Oh gosh, back that then? really work. I know. They forgot, I feel like what, or they never knew. They never I knew know. that that was possibility on a landline to live for more than one person to be in on the same phone I conversation. Know. I feel like my kid's reaction to that is the same as my reaction to party lines, you know, where people are like, and anybody in the neighborhood could just pick up the phone and listen like that didn't really happen. Or if it did, it must've been like 200 years ago. Right. <laughs> but nope, nope. That was my parents' phone. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I think this is going to lead to some fun discussion about what does it mean to watch over the affairs 
of your household and not eat the bread of idleness might not be as fun. That's the one I'm like, oh, do we have to talk about idleness? That sounds sad. Yeah, it but really does. Do you want to open us up in prayer and then we can dive into our discussion? Yes. God, thanks again for an opportunity to talk about Proverbs 31. We just pray that you would, as always, just guide and direct our conversation and open us up to things that are unexpected about this passage of scripture. We just pray that you'd be glorified in our lives and in our homes, in our parenting. I just, I, I pray for the balance between watching vigilantly over our households and being able to respect and, and give our kids, those of us that have kids, just give our kids the respect and the incremental increases of privacy and autonomy that that probably are going to be necessary as they get older. Show us what that line is and and show us how to let go of areas as we oversee our homes, but but also show us how to let go and when and where and how that is necessary and beneficial. Help us to allow them to fail in areas while they're under our roof in small ways that will help them to be able to learn valuable lessons so that when the the stakes are higher, they're able to, to handle themselves with wisdom and with independence. Amen. Right. So I'm already thinking like, man, it's too early to dive into all this heavy stuff. So I know. Sorry. <laughs> all right. She watches over the affairs of her household. Let's start with just what is what pictures come to mind when you read that one? And what does it kind of tell you about your role as a wife and as a mom? Well, so the, the first thing that came to me when I was looking at this, I kind of, before we discuss the passages, I'll kind of sometimes look at either the lexicon or mm -hmm. a commentary or something. And the one thing about this passage that I saw is the word for watches can also be translated as spies. She spies over the affairs of her household. Mm -hmm. So not just being present, but being observant and digging deep. And, you know, I, you could take that to an extreme and become sneaky. Oh. Like we're talking about like, right. oh, are you going to be sneaky? Are you going to be not trusting of, right. of your family members, whether it's your husband or your kids? Mm -hmm. Do you search the pockets? Do you think the worst of them before, before you give them the benefit of the doubt? You could take it to that extreme, which I don't believe is biblical or, or what God would want for us to be mistrusting or distrusting. But at the same time, it's like, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we need to be shrewd and we need to not just maintain our homes, but I do think that there's a level of digging deeper that needs to be done. And I don't think that has to be sneaky though, but I, I do think that there's a digging deeper. So that kind of, I don't know, that made me think about, am I just, going through the motions of running a home, getting kids to where they need to be, mm -hmm. husband, you know, helping him out where he needs help, him helping me where I need help. But, or are we getting under the surface? And I think for me, where I went with that in my head is, I know that with our kids, I had a conversation with our, our middle son just the other day. It was at night and he was getting ready for bed and he just started talking to me. And I realize how few and far between those conversations are as they get older. When they were mm -hmm. little, they loved for me to go into their room at night, read books. That was when they mm -hmm. would stall before bedtime right. and the conversations would happen. Aww. But they don't stall before bedtime anymore. They just want to go on their own and go to their rooms and go to bed. And like, we don't have as much of that stalling time. Yeah. And what I have really noticed is... I like, I'm an introvert. And so I like mm -hmm. my downtime also. So there could be times when I'm listening to a podcast while I'm making dinner or reading a book or, you know, Matt and I go downstairs to watch a movie together and just kind of send them off to bed. And mm -hmm. they're happy to sit and watch YouTube or, right. you know, listen to an audio book. And so I realize I need to be intentional about making time to connect and not being selfish about my desire 
to have downtime where I'm just kind of zoning out too, because I will, if left to my own devices, if I'm not intentional about it, I'll get them where they need to go. I'll provide for their basic needs, right. but I'll detach emotionally at times when mm -hmm. I need to be digging in deeper, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is a hard one because you also could go so overboard that you become like the overbearing mom. Why haven't you told me about your day or, you right. know what I mean? And you don't right. want to, you don't want to be like that. So I think it really depends on every family's personality. When you were talking about not wanting to be sneaky, I would put the caveat until your child shows you that you need to be to protect their safety, right? Um, and that's why yeah. we've made this blanket rule for our kids at any time, we are going to see what you are doing because, you know, what if my kid was interacting with some like strange adult man that we no didn't know? Like that's right. very <laughs> worrisome. And, well, and, we and it's very possible that. in this day and age, even it if- is even if you talk to them about it, because I, they mm -hmm. kind of joke around with me sometimes about, well, mm -hmm. it's not a, you know, like if they're playing a game, mm -hmm. I don't like them to have like a chat feature or anything. Right. It's mm -hmm. not like I'm going to go like run off with a stranger and get abducted and they think it's funny, but it's yeah. not, it's very it's possible. Not. And it kind of reminds me of what we talked about in our discussion about financial abuse and how like the number one way that sets you up to be a victim of a scam is to feel as if you are smart enough to detect and avoid any potential scam. Yes. And so I think we yes. do need to be aware that even the smartest, most protected, most innocent of children would become prey. And, and that leads to a huge prayer burden for the children of the world who are vulnerable to all of these things. And again, I, I'm going to keep going back. It's too early in the day to have this discussion right now, but it, it is, it's heavy stuff. What I showed the kids, it can be a little distressing, but there are videos that you can watch. It's, it's, it's sort of like, like the little kid version. It's, you go up to the parent in the park and ask their permission and the stranger comes up and asks their kid, hey, I lost my puppy. Can you come help? And you see how many little kids say, sure, I'll come help, even if they've had the discussion with their parents about that. Or for tweens and teens, it's I, I think it's very distasteful to do this to a kid, but there are like people who give somebody permission to approach their kid on social media and show their child how quickly you can give out your personal information to the wrong person. So I, I've got, I don't even have mixed feelings. I think it's terrible to like set your kid up and like do that for fake. Right. Do a kid <laughs> but, sting. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically what it is. But since the videos are there and I'm just going to pretend may that maybe a hundred percent of them are reenactments, which would make me feel better. Mm -hmm. I, I showed a couple of them to my children because I wanted them to see how, like I said, even the most protected, somebody who wouldn't like check all the boxes for someone that you, you should keep your eye on that when they're sneaky, they could still fall into some of these traps. Now, this leads to the question, if, if someone in your family does fall victim to some kind of scam or some kind of you know, predatory online something and heaven forbid it gets worse than that. But like, let's say you find out that, you know, your hypothetical daughter has hypothetically been chatting with some 30 year old guy that she doesn't know. And now she thinks like that they're in love or something. Okay. A, that is terrifying. B, how guilty should you feel for that? Right? Like how much of that is on you because here's the other thing with our phones and I know my kids don't listen to this podcast so I'm going to say it I don't know enough about all of their apps to know how they would get around stuff but I know that there are things that exist that even if I you know every single day went through and looked at their entire phone history I wouldn't be able to see so yeah. No, at I, what point, yeah, yeah you know, at they what have point, fake Instagram accounts and yeah. fake 
you know, fake profiles on places, mm -hmm. even if you have all of the parental control stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I looked into it fairly recently, kind of a, like different parental controls that you can get. And mm -hmm. I even got a trial of one of them mm -hmm. and it went and said, oh, sorry, we can't monitor this particular yeah. thing because mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's tough. There's, there are yeah. ways around it if you're, mm -hmm. if your kid is motivated enough. And right. like you said, I don't know enough. I'm not as savvy as them. Mm -hmm. And the the Gen Alpha, the Gen Zs, like they're mm -hmm. they're beyond us with most technology, especially on phone technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then it begs a question: like, how? Yes, it is our responsibility to protect our children. It is our responsibility to know what they're doing online. But how do we do that if you know, like, the only safe answer I could think of is, well, don't give them a phone, <laughs> right? right? But even then, you know, they can be logging on to things at a friend's house or stuff like that. But the answer also isn't to just throw up your hands and be like, well, you know, good luck, kid. <laughs> so what do we do? I think we need to have conversations. And I think we need to, you know, just have respect in the beginning for sure i mean if they haven't mm -hmm. given you a reason i think there needs to be respect and there needs to be you know i the thing that i that i have said to our kids a lot we have one kid who will sometimes not tell us the truth about silly mm -hmm. things like brushing their mm -hmm. teeth right. or doing homework you know stuff like that mm -hmm. and that is disturbing to me in a lot of ways because a lie is a lie and mm -hmm. and we just have the conversation about this was more so when they were little but it you know it it translates to other things mm -hmm. and but the conversation that we have is you can break trust and you can build trust and mm -hmm. breaking trust takes a second building right. trust takes a long time and mm -hmm. that kid you know, basically gets reminded when maybe we're harder on that one than another one or ask right. more questions or take the phone mm -hmm. more frequently right. than the one that doesn't break trust or the mm -hmm. ones or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that kid is reminded that, you know, well, I'm doing this because it mm -hmm. takes a long time to build trust. Do you remember? And yeah. not to regurgitate or what do you call it? Like dredge up old stuff right. and hold on to grudges, but mm -hmm. to remind them, okay, it was this long ago that this yep. thing happened. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't enough time to have gone by for that trust to be built up to where it was before that. So yeah. you need to earn it back. And again, like we like to give both sides of stories. There's a fine line between holding grudges and belittling and mm -hmm. a kid making a mistake and not being able to be forgiven for that and, and mm -hmm. building back trust. So, you know, I don't know. So that's a convoluted way of saying, number one, I think yeah. you need to begin with respect, maintain respect and, and maintain the, wow, that was hard for you to admit that you lied about that. If you did, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, when mm -hmm. they come around to say, oh, I'm sorry, I actually did not tell you the truth about that. Making yeah. a big deal about truthfulness. Um, mm -hmm and giving incremental responsibility back and incremental trust back after trust has been broken. Um, mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of prayer. It takes, if you're your spouse, talking with your spouse about how to make that happen. I mean, there's so many moving parts. You can't just give a, a formula for how that can mm -hmm. happen. Um, right. But I think the conversations need to happen. And I think like what you said about your kids and, we we're not going to snoop around, but we have the right to ask at any time. I think that kind mm -hmm. of openness is important because if they don't trust you to respect them in that way mm -hmm. and to put that on them, like you're going to know that I'm going to ask for this device. So you're going to need to act in a responsible way and in a way that, that is, that shows integrity, you know, whether someone's watching mm -hmm. or not, you're going to have to be acting the yeah. same way because you know that someone will be watching at some point 
instead of not having the conversation, not setting the stage for transparency, and then you snoop mm-hmm. and you find something, and then then you kind of put them in a position where they feel defensive. And I feel like that makes them want to burrow deeper into secrecy rather than mm-hmm. own up to a mistake and move forward with integrity. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And then the question becomes, all right, so let's say that I think most of us, let's, let's just say, let's pretend you have this hypothetical daughter. And let's say most of us would say that until you have like a very dire reason to feel like her safety is at risk, if you don't, that journal that you know she keeps should be off limits, in my opinion. And I, I don't think that's super controversial. Now, I'm I'm sure some families have it set up in different ways. But mm-hmm. let's say that you do flub up. Let's say you're stripping her bed, you find the journal, you open it up, you read it, and you find out something troubling. You find out that she has a friend who's actually in an abusive situation or something like that. It becomes a safety issue at that point. Like you said, at that point, it is going to break her trust in you for you to do something with that. But my opinion is as the adult, I don't know what, what would you do in that specific situation? I mean, off the top of my head, I feel like I would go to, the kid first and say, Mm -hmm. you know, and rather than going behind their back and reporting it or something, go to Mm -hmm. them and have the discussion about, I saw this, this is, you know, cause that is kind of another facet of, of when our kids talk to us a lot of times, you Mm -hmm. know, Sometimes the kid will say, hey, if I tell you something, do you promise you won't tell anybody right. or do you promise you won't? And I'm like, <laughs> mm-hmm. no, I can't do that. And I'm like, I, the only way I can promise that is if it's something that's not going to, you know, involve harm to someone else. Yeah. Or if somebody's you know, in danger, if someone's in I danger, they that know promise. that they know that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but I think I would go to that that kid first and give them the opportunity to handle it Mm -hmm. before going behind their back, but it needs to be brought into light for sure. Mm -hmm. I actually had a situation in high school where I knew about someone who was, who was in a dangerous, you know, potentially Mm -hmm. dangerous situation. And that person had made me promise not to say anything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say anything. And there was actually a, a teacher that came out and confronted me because he had noticed some things that he mm-hmm. and he knew that I was close to this person uh-huh. and kind of called me out, not called me out, but asked me pointedly, mm-hmm. is this going on with this person? Yeah. And, and I'm pretty sure that I didn't specifically say yes, but that oh. the way that I responded, that right. it was. Yeah. And so I went to that person and said, I think so-and-so might know that this is going on. And mm-hmm. so I, yeah. And, and looking back, I later apologized to this person because I felt like I did them a disservice by not saying something to right. someone. It mm-hmm. didn't turn out bad and it worked out okay. And mm-hmm. everything was addressed, right. but I did feel like I did the wrong thing by not bringing it to light, even though I knew that the person would have been furious with me. I know. Um, and that's hard to put on a kid too. You know, mm-hmm. I think you need to to recognize. So like, for example, if I found out that my kid was keeping a secret for a friend and then the friend did get hurt, I would be very overzealous about making them not feel guilty about it. You know? Uh, right. Exactly. Because you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Exactly. Like, hey, we know that what you thought you were doing was being the best of friend that you could. And mm-hmm. now you know that there are certain times where being an even better friend means risking getting them mad at you but you did what you were supposed to be doing or you did what you thought you you did what you thought was best with the information you had because yeah that that is so hard for kids and and as a child or a teen like the thought of losing a friend is so painful you know and so I would I would yeah that's a hard situation to be in. Did I ever tell you the story in junior high where we were told to write anonymous essays? 
So our Refresh teacher Refresh my memory because it sounds yeah. kind of like maybe, but I don't know what it's about. We'll yeah. See. We were supposed to write anonymous essays on the topic of, is there sexual harassment at our middle school? And we were told like a dozen times, you're not going to put your name on this. This is just for like, even the teacher's not going to read it. This is going straight to the office. Nothing, nobody's going to get in trouble for any of this. We just kind of want to know what you think. gauge the climate yeah. of the of the exactly high school. this is an high anonymous school or junior survey high? junior high junior high okay and so I wrote and because I had been so assured I was like oh good I have things I want to get off my chest <laughs> because this is in the 90s and and these were like really rude boys who were doing things like snapping bras or spanking girls if they were bent over to tie their shoes and I had one friend specifically who was like getting harassed more than others in this way and so I'm like oh good like they tell me you don't need to write names like we don't want you to write the names of students we don't want you to write your name we just want to tell tell us what you see so I got it all off my chest Next day, I get called into the vice principal's office. Oh, no. <laughs> How did they know it was you? They, they probably just showed the essay to my teacher. And, and the they teacher said, said, whose handwriting is, is this? Alana's and that's not going to be hard. Oh, my um, goodness. And Ugh. we had just done the thing. So everybody sees me get called out. Everybody sees me come back in. Ugh. I was, again, I was terrified that my friend was going to be mad at me. My, my girlfriend, the one who was being harassed. But basically the vice principal was like, don't ask me how I know, but I know you wrote this. I need you to tell me who the students are involved in this. Oh my and, goodness. And so looking back, I still am, am conflicted because I, I do feel like the behavior that was happening to my friend was over the top and did need to stop. However, the way they got that information out of me was dishonest and did break my trust and potentially put me in a really bad situation my friend and and she she was very sweet like that same day she's like you know what I know you got called to the office I know what they talked to you about it's okay mm-hmm. but it could have been way worse you know like I could have been right completely like socially ostracized for the rest yeah. of the year for being the tattletale well, and so, it could have been something that it could have been something that, like, if you didn't know her well to know that she considered it harassment, some you know, mm-hmm. it it could have yeah. been something where she was she was enjoying the attention. Yeah, it's or like, she hey, was you made this kid stop it, flirting were, with me. You know, right, exactly. <laughs> That's how some, and some people and would have looked they at it, put you into a bad such. Oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. Well, so, that, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you want to I was I was going to ask you like what should the administration have done what happened what yeah. did they do right and what did they do wrong well that's I I feel I don't know if I can answer that I, what it made me think of though was as parents or teachers of kids or whatever it is mm-hmm. as as adults in relation to kids I just feel like it's so important for us to have I don't know like if I tell my kids always tell me the truth. And I will, I will not, sometimes I'll tell them, if you tell me the truth, I will not get mad. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, if you tell me the truth about something, I'm not going to get mad. You will have a consequence probably, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to get angry with you for telling me the truth when I confront you about something. Mm-hmm. But I will get angry And there will be worse punishments if you lie to me about it and don't tell me the the truth. Mm -hmm. But you have to follow through with that. So when you say something to your kids, it's tempting to be like, you did what? Right. (laughs) And, you know, or, oh, I'm so disappointed in you. How could you ever do Mm -hmm. that? But Mm -hmm. you have to, just like the administration says, it's going to be anonymous. We just want you to be honest. If you are inviting honesty you have to follow through with what you say. So I Mm -hmm. think a better way to approach it with the administration would be if they say it, I mean, I just, I think if they presented it as this has to be anonymous, I think they should have kept it anonymous. Yeah. But I think you have to think through, okay, you have to think through the consequences. As a parent, I can't tell my kids, be honest with me and I'll always keep your secret. Or be honest right. with me, never mm-hmm. involve another family or another parent or another child right. 
in the conversation mm-hmm. because you can't make that promise. Yeah. So I think what they should have done was be upfront at first. And if they wanted an anonymous tip about some kind of harassment that was happening, if they wanted names, they should say, if you see something happening, write it down and, and if, and, and put the name down and mm-hmm. then, and then follow up and speak with, I mean, having worked at a middle school myself, yeah. the way that they would do things is if you witness something happening, you write it down and you can put names down, but those people will be called in and then we'll ask for their side of the story and their opinion Mm -hmm. on on what happens, but they will take each person separately and speak to those people and give them the opportunity to tell their story. And, you know, that way, if the person that was being harassed doesn't want to press charges, so to speak, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then they talk to them first and say, is this an issue? Someone brought it up as, as having seen you being harassed. Is this an issue? Okay. And then if that person says, no, it, I don't want to make a big deal about this or no, it wasn't like that, then they don't bring in the next people. So, you know, I feel like bringing you in and then asking you for the names afterwards mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. was awful. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So maybe just ask you to anonymously put names in if you see it Mm -hmm. happening so that they can investigate further without bringing you in or bringing you out of class for it. That's my thought. But yeah, what do you think? It is. It it is a hard one because I mean, even on a political level, right, you have the question of privacy versus security. Mm -hmm. Um, You have, you know, I mean, let's take it to very, I mean, realistic extremes, but not realistic for everyday people like you and me. Are you going to, you know, let's say you know that somebody has planned this terrorist attack and the only way to get them to talk circumvents the law, right? People are going to have strong opinions about what should be done (laughs) in a case like that. And so sometimes security and safety and privacy do feel like they have sometimes can be in conflict with each other. I'm very, very glad that on a national or international or political level, I don't need to, you know, make any decisions <laughs> regarding that because that's something I am that's very, <laughs> that's way above my pay grade. But from a parent, I think we we have similar stuff like that too, right? Or you know how with detectives, I forget the exact phrase, it's something like tainted evidence or something like that, where it's like, I know, like I I found the the fingerprint, but I didn't have the search warrant. So that evidence is like, I know you did it, but legally I can't pin it right. on you, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's stuff like that. And so, you know, it's kind of like the question of, okay, well, you shouldn't have been reading your kid's journal, but since you did and you found this out, what are you going to do with that information? And it is, it's really hard. I definitely want to speak to people in marriage relationships as well, because in certain cases there, there is mistrust, there's desire for snooping, right? Like what's, what's my husband doing? Who's texting him at 11 at night? I'm going to go and look at his phone and, and stuff like that. And again, I think it, I don't think there's a blanket answer. I don't think that every single relationship has the exact same rules regarding trust and privacy, but I think you also need to know if you were to err on one side or the other, would you err on the side of being too suspicious and too insecure and always like convinced that your husband's about to cheat on you or are you the type who's more likely to like bury your head in the sand like whatever's going on I really 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 don't want to know about it so even if all the signs are there and like your friends and your neighbor and the postman like all know what's going on but you're just not willing to to see it like where do you fall on that spectrum I think can also help you because if you if you know in your most honest conversation with yourself if you know that you're prone to being suspicious and mistrustful of your spouse or your kids or your co-workers or your friends you feel like everybody's out to get you and everybody's got secrets against you then I do feel like your whatever guidelines you set in terms of respecting other people's privacy needs to be a little more not not extreme but you, you need to be careful and you need to set those very deliberately if you're the type of person who 
it can go the other way, right? Like let's say every single time your kid or even your husband is on the phone and you walk in the room and they look super guilty and they turn it off real quick and they like hide it under the cushion. That is troubling behavior, that right? Might and be it's, a red flag. <laughs> it might be a red flag. And so it's it's easier with the kid because we have a significantly higher level of like responsibility and authority over our kids. So at that point you say, give me your phone, unlock it and show me what you were doing. And if you refuse to do any of those and you just don't get your phone back, right? Like, but you can't do that to your husband, <laughs> right? So I don't know. I, I feel like this is all just really murky. And I feel like all we've done is talk in, not necessarily in circles, like we've brought up some really good points, but I don't know that we've come up with many solutions or <laughs> practical yeah, I, tips. I think we've had a few practical tips just about honesty and respect with your kids. I think that's a foundational yeah. thing, like mm -hmm. being open and honest about like, rather than snooping or sneaking, mm -hmm. giving them maybe the at least at first, like you said, unless yeah. they're being deceitful and you know that mm -hmm. and you have to snoop mm -hmm. and sneak, you know, if your kid yeah. has a drug habit yeah. and they're hiding it, I mean, obviously, yeah, yeah. then you search their room when they're not there. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but in the very beginning, establishing the, the fact that, hey, we're going to give you the opportunity to build trust with us. We're mm -hmm. going to give you the opportunity to live with integrity and we are going to help keep you accountable to that and give you that like pressure to do it by knowing that at any point we can look at anything that we want to or need to, to kind mm. of see where you're at. But also I think, but I, I think that prayer comes into this, you know, uh, just in terms of, like you said, where am I on the spectrum? Like sometimes mm. maybe we don't even know, like, are right. you, are you jealous? Are you mm -hmm. suspicious as in general? Have you had uh, trauma in the past yeah. in relationships or in experiences that have made you distrustful or mistrustful right. of people? Then maybe, you know, pray for God to reveal that. Or on the other end of it, are you just kind of stuck with your head in the sand? And mm -hmm. do you need to be a little bit more shrewd as a serpent yeah. to be able to acknowledge i mean i know i'm like a peace loving person i love mm -hmm. harmony in our family <laughs> yeah and sometimes at the expense of having hard conversations yeah. so i i definitely know that for me i need to be open to having hard conversations and mm -hmm. being available and making room to hear things that maybe i don't want to know but need to know so that I can mm -hmm. be a good parent and, and shepherd kids in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, but I, I think that those are kind of some basic guidelines and, and it, you know, praying, taking time to pray for this whole thing and just pray, you know, starting off with this prayer, father, help me to watch over the affairs of my household. Help me, mm -hmm. help me to have eyes to see not just what's going on on the surface, but to catch the moment that, that I see my kid, you know, who seems happy most of the time mm -hmm. having this moment where they're, they're not happy about something and digging deeper yeah. into it, not just safety related, just emotionally yes. relationships yeah. that they're having, you know, asking mm -hmm. questions instead like of yeah. plugging, you know, putting my headphones on while I'm cooking dinner. And instead of doing that, taking them off sometimes and making time mm -hmm. to ask questions of, of the kids, how, how they're doing yeah. But on the, on the other side of it, not being a busy body, reading the room, knowing that your kids need some personal space, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, unfortunately we can't give a recipe because every family, every person, every kid, every within families, each relationship yeah. within each child or within each mm -hmm. marriage is going to be different. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think another great prayer can just always be a prayer that truth gets exposed and truth comes to light, yes. you know, whether you're talking about what's going on with your kids or what's going on with your spouse, or let's say you're childless and unmarried, just what's going on at the workplace or with your friends, right? Just always be, I think that's a, a great blanket prayer for truth to be revealed in circumstances like God help me to know the things that I need to know today for my safety, for my well-being, for the protection of those around me. And that way it can also 
silence that persistent, oh no, am I am I not on my kids enough, right? Am I not aware enough about what they're doing? And so again, like God, when it, it, it comes with humility, it's God, I know that there are things that my loved ones can do that I won't know about because I am not omniscient, <laughs> but you <Darn> are, <laughs> right? <laughs> so please make sure that I am diligent. And I think that's where the second part of this verse can come in. She doesn't eat the bread of idleness. Help me to be diligent, but help me also to be humble enough to recognize, no, I cannot protect my child from a hundred percent of the things that could happen to them. And I cannot be aware a hundred percent of the time of their thoughts and their feelings and their conversations with others. So help me to trust that you will bring to light the things that they need to know. And also a really good prayer would be like, help them to have the friends who would be willing to risk them getting mad by saying, Hey, my friend's getting harassed or, Hey, my friend's hurting themselves or, you know, my, Hey, my friend's in an unsafe situation. They might get mad at me for telling you this, but, and I think whatever age, if you are a parent and, you know, your kids are still kids, I think it is important to have the conversation with them. Hey, if you know that a friend is going through something safe or, you know, unsafe, even if you're afraid it's going to make them mad at you and and maybe it will, it's still important to tell somebody. And that doesn't have to be me, but that can be like the youth pastor or the school counselor or a teacher to encourage them to be willing to risk their friend getting mad at them for their friend's protection, because that's a huge step in selfless love, right? I'm going to risk Jamie getting mad at me, which is going to feel like the worst thing in the world to me, but I'm going to do that if I know that it might help her not be in this unsafe situation or something like that. Yeah. Agreed. And the flip side of all of it, I mean, for each of these passages, I think we talk a lot about not letting these cause guilt And as I think about some of the things that I, that this brought to light for me, like have the conversations, don't, don't just, you know, go through the motions of home, but there are times when putting the headphones on and listening to a podcast or being, you know, in, in my own space for a while is not a bad thing. And so Mm -hmm. don't think that it means that you have to be helicopter mom or smother mother. You know, just make sure their mother. (laughs) Yeah. I had a, I actually, I had a dear friend who tragically has passed away since, since Mm -hmm. then, but, um, but growing up, I had a a dear friend and her mom used to call herself smother mother because she used to always, she, (laughs) the, the one thing that I remember that she would do is she would like give her toilet seat covers to carry with her. Oh, huh. Public restrooms. Public restrooms. And stuff. And like just stuff like that where she was just always like, Over prepared, but in a in an uh-huh. awesome way. She was a great mom and sweet. But anyway, but yeah, don't don't feel like like you don't feel guilty, and and let this guilt you into overdoing the mm. the micromanaging or the yeah. spying or the investigating or whatever. Right. Yeah. But always keep it in balance. So yeah, because sometimes it can have roots in pride. It the root could be if I work hard enough. I will make sure my child or my household are protected from every single calamity that could befall them. And, and we just can't. And I mean, I kind of wish we could, (laughs) but since we can't, there is a sense of surrender, right? Surrendering your like, God, I need to throw on my headphones and let my brain decompress for 20 minutes. right? Right. Or, or God, I'm really worried about my kid, but I have no idea how to even approach the subject. I'm going to need you to kind of wedge that door open for me. There are times to recognize our limitations as parents and what we do and don't know as well. So, yeah. Cool. Well, I feel like we should end on something lighter, but you know, our only other option is to talk about idleness, which is probably going to not make anybody feel all that great either. So how about on a completely unrelated, since we're, we're talking about watching over the affairs of your household, what's a good show or movie you've watched lately? Oh man, let's see. 
<laughs> and now we're like, wait, what would be appropriate to <laughs> to mention <laughs> on a on a podcast for Christians? That's right. I don't that think is we have super racy. That's tastes, the double but... <laughs> layer. The double layer. Um, oh my goodness! I know that I have watched. Oh, can I can I say a good book that I yeah sure recently? Uh-huh. Um, so we went on this big drive to Kansas City and back for memorial service for for my husband's uncle. And we listened to Project Hail Mary. And I am such a sci-fi nerd. I mm, love sci-fi. Mm-hmm. And it's by the same author, Andy Weir, who wrote The right. Martian. I knew I the had movie, heard the Martian. Of it. Yep. Yeah. So it's it was really good. And it was the second time I had listened to it. And it was just as good the second time. Mm. But yeah, I love science fiction to me, it actually makes me just worship God. Like I just, especially when, when I just think about the possibilities of just the vastness of the universe and the possibilities Mm -hmm. of all the different crazy things that could happen. It just like thinking of what could be reminds me of what we don't know, which reminds me of how big God is. So anyway, that's pretty cool because I know there are a lot of Christians who like, I grew up like we, we, oops, I'm sorry. I think I I think my phone just made noise but I didn't hear it okay good (laughs) when I was growing up it was as if like fantasy and sci-fi were almost like spiritually dangerous right they're like this is you know like a stepping stone to witchcraft or Mm -hmm. you know something like that just like my notes with the hieroglyphics and the like (laughs) magical symbols yeah so I love just that that different perspective. I'm going to give a plug for something that I've been watching and listening to lately. I found this new, it's, well, so it's a YouTube channel of, it's called the Angel City Corral. And it's this like 100, 150 person chorus. They were in America's Got Talent a while back. So if you saw a really big chorus singing Africa, that was probably them. Do you remember that that one? No, but I love that song. But they have, they have some really good music there the one i'm trying to find it's called baba yetu and it is the lord's prayer in swahili um mm. it's really really powerful so they they don't sing just it's on a christian chorus but some of the music that they sing does have like christian roots like the baba yetu or they have a really good one of a poor rare wayfaring stranger do you know that old hymn yes so that that's been a fun one for me. So yeah, that is what I had been watching, which ties back to us talking about watching over the affairs of our household. I just wanted to end on something a little lighter because I feel like everything we talked about was like, you know, all all of our kids are gonna get abducted and I know, you know, I know. Can I add one more thing that was really neat to watch? Yeah. So there's a, there's a YouTube video and it's been around for a long time, but it's, it's, I believe in, I don't remember where it was, what country, I think it's in Israel, maybe in Jerusalem. I don't know where it is, but this one guy, I don't remember his name, but he, he conducts music and he's kind of like an activist to bring unity across Hmm. like basically the Palestinian, Israeli, Middle East, but it's, it's this chorus of one day by modest yahoo you know that song um Mm, like the one day one day one day one day anyway but the um, casting crowns one day (laughs) but yeah but it's sometimes in my tears i drown you know that one anyway but it's just one day it's like all my life i've been waiting for anyway that there'll be no more war and the children will Mm. say one day anyway but our children will play together anyway but this beautiful song about unity and about one day there will be no Uh more war there'll be peace and they brought together people from from israel palestinians like basically arab israeli people in this congregation singing this and they bring in some people singing in what is the like anyway sing there's arabic yeah yeah anyway but basically people singing in in different languages and showing like panning the crowd and showing these people Mm -hmm. uh, which my husband and I watched it the other day, just in light of the escalating war in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, It just, it was just kind of a beautiful, just, I don't know, just a beautiful display of peace between people. Yeah, that is beautiful. But anyway, not to bring up war, which is heavy and... (laughs) 
Well, that is okay. I was going to suggest that maybe we close in prayer. This will probably air after, but we're recording it just a few days before the U.S. elections. And oh, yeah. I think, you know, all the stuff that we've talked about. Yeah. Would you mind just closing us up in prayer and then we'll, we'll wrap up for the day? Will do. God, we just thank you for, thank you, thank you that you're the God who reigns over heavy topics. You're the God who reigns over our deepest fears and concerns for our children. You're the God who reigns over our homes, our families. You're the God who reigns even in spite of warring nations and the difficult things that we face every day in, in the front page of the news. You are sovereign over elections. And, and we just praise you for that, God. You are, you are on the throne, no matter what, no matter what, what the world throws at us, you're there and you promise to be at work in all things. And so we just, we, we lift that up to you, Lord. We just thank you for being at work in our families and our homes and in our relationships with our children, even when they do things that we wish they wouldn't do. And we just pray, like Alana said, we pray that you would expose truth. I just pray that our homes, our families would be places where truth would prevail and where there's no corner or crevice where Satan would have the opportunity to work in seclusion and in secret. And, and we just pray that in Jesus name. We pray for the U.S., for the election coming up. Father, that truth would prevail, that you would expose any lies, that you would expose any deceit, anything going on that could prevent democracy from prevailing, that you would just have your hand on the election and that whatever the outcome, that you'd be at work in that. And then that candidates rule over our, our nation for the next four years and in all of the other elections that are important that are taking place on that day as well, that are lower and less lower profile, but just as or maybe even more important we just pray for our country and for those listening we pray as as they pray for their countries we just pray that your glory that you would be glorified in everything that happens in our daily lives on a micro scale in our families to a macro scale to our our nations and our and, and the greater world at large lord that you would just be glorified and we just pray that you would help us to go forward in our day, not with a feeling of heaviness or dread for anything that was discussed today or that we are facing right now, but that you would lift that burden and that you would replace it with the peace that transcends understanding that would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, that we would be able to walk in freedom and not bondage to fear or suspicion or anything else, but that we would walk in freedom knowing that you are on the throne and we praise you and we love you. Amen.